Okay, uh, today um, uh, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Mark Jacobson, uh, who we have the pleasure of, of hearing today. Uh, Mark Jacobson is a professor at Stanford and an expert in computer modeling, uh, particularly of atmospheric phenomena. And uh, for those contributions, for example, uh, in 2005, he received the American Meteorological Society Henry E. Hooten Award for significant, significant contributions to modeling aerosol chemistry and to understanding the role of soot and other carbon particles on climate. Uh, in 2013, he received the American Geophysical Union Ascent Award for his dominating role in the development of models to identify the role of black carbon in, com in climate change. Um, so he's uh, an, a very accomplished scientist uh, in particularly atmospheric phenomena. But what he's done is he's sort of turned that scientific expertise into becoming uh, an expert and um, I don't know, a spokesperson is the right word, uh, on climate change. And uh, of course, it's a very important thing. Uh, for example, I mean, he's asked by members of Congress to uh, give his opinion uh, uh, routinely. And um, for these sort of uh, uh, policy or green efforts, in 2013, uh, he was awarded the Global Green Policy Design Award for the design of analysis and policy framework to envision a future powered by renewable energy. In 2016, he received uh, the, the Cazarol Prize from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for outstanding scientific ex excellence and originality um, in his paper on a solution to the US grid reliability problem with 100% wind, water, and solar power. Um, so, He's envisioning a future uh, carbon-free um, reduction of uh, global warming impact uh, based upon wind, water, and solar power. And uh, we're anxious to see what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Keith, and also um, for having me come to the University of Delaware to give a talk on this work that we've been doing to transition, to look at the possibility or the potential of transitioning each country's and US state's energy infrastructure to 100% clean renewable energy. And so I wanna first motivate this by saying, well, why do we care about this problem? I mean, I know you're all pretty concerned, I'm sure. Uh, from our point of view, we're looking at it from three prongs, air pollution, uh, global climate change and energy security. Uh, worldwide, four to seven million people die prematurely each year from air pollution, from cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma. 20% are children under the age of five years old and mostly in de developing countries. And in the United States, it's about 60 to 65,000 die prematurely and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, become ill. Uh, California alone has around 13,000 premature deaths. This overall worldwide, it costs the world about 20 to $25 trillion per year today based on statistical cost of life and of illness. Uh, global warming is already a serious problem costing trillions of dollars, but is expected to cost another, you know, in addition to the air pollution, climate, uh, air pollution health cost, 25 to trillion, $30 trillion per year by 2050. And of course, energy security is an important point of view. Fossil fuels are limited resources. They're going to run out at some point, at which point the prices will rise uh, astronomically due to the high demand for energy and limited resource. And this will lead to economic, social, and political instability. So we think that we need to consider transitioning today to clean renewable energy to solve all these problems. So let me just illustrate a little bit more the problems and then I'll get to the solutions. Uh, you know, we look out here and the air seems pretty clean because you don't see this dark pollution like you will you see in New Delhi or in many cities in Southeast Asia. And here's, a, here's one from China in November 2015. Uh, much of the world looks like this in inner cities or even metropolitan regions. And it's equivalent to smoking two to three packs of cigarettes per day. And 
These are the lungs of a teenage non-smoker who died in Los Angeles in the 1970s. And this was what Los Angeles air pollution looked like in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. But these are the impacts. I mean, living in a polluted city, even in the United States today, the average person loses about six to nine months of their life uh, due to the assault of particles primarily, air pollution particles on their lungs. And these particles are emitted primarily through combustion processes through the burning of fossil fuels. So this is one thing we're trying to eliminate is the, is the air pollution problem simultaneously with solving the climate problem. In terms of climate change, uh, you know, we know that, well, 2016 may be the warmest year on record and record being from land and ship-based measurements since about 1850. And of course, the rate of change of temperature today is greater it's 10 times higher than during the deglaciation from the last ice age, and 25 times higher than during the last 1,000 years. So it's the rate of change of temperature today is so high. And if we look at right now, we're at about one degree warming on the annual average above mid-1800 levels. And the world is trying to avoid one and a half degree warming total. So we only have about a half a degree to spare before we can expect more uh, damaging effects of global climate change. Ultimately, if all the ice melts worldwide, that would raise sea levels between around 75 to 80 meters, and that would flood 7% of all the world's land. Of course, that's a bit, one of the big impacts, but we also see other impacts like more severe storminess, uh, droughts in some places, increased flooding in other places, uh, more severe air pollution itself, uh, also heat stress, heat stroke, oceans are acidified, so coral reefs die, lots of fish species die. Uh, there's a lot of impacts of climate change, but I'm not gonna dwell on those. I'll just point out here that you see a lot more warming. This is the difference in warming for January 2016 versus the 1951 to 1980 average. And there's enhanced warming over the Arctic region because well, any snow covered or sea ice covered surface, you'll get enhanced warming because as you melt snow and sea ice due to higher temperatures, you uncover darker ocean below or if you have snow on top of sea ice, you uncover darker sea ice below the snow. And that will allow more sunlight to be absorbed by the, those surfaces, heating up the ocean faster, causing more melting and more warming ultimately. So whenever you have snow or sea ice covered surfaces, you're gonna have greater temperature changes due to global warming. That's what's occurring here, why you have so much, so much higher temperature increases over the Arctic. But this is a critical slide, must be the last one showing this, the problems, but it'll also help to understand the solutions. So the net observed global warming, on, which is the bar on the right, which in this, this is an old diagram, so that was 0.8 degrees, now it's one degree Celsius. That's really a, the sum of greenhouse gas warming on the left, which the major greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, but they also have methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, ozone those cause more than two degree warming, much more than it's observed. And you also have particles that cause warming, dark particles, fossil fuel and biofuel soot and biomass burning soot, which are uh, like the stuff that comes out of a diesel truck or bus, it's the black smoke. And sometimes you see brown smoke from biomass burning. Those, those dark particles absorb sunlight directly and heat the air directly and which whereas greenhouse gases absorb heat radiation from the surface of the earth, so they operate differently. But the black carbon is actually a million times more powerful than carbon dioxide per unit mass at warming the air. But it has a much shorter lifetime and there's a lot less black carbon in the air than there is carbon dioxide. So, but in aggregate, soot particles are the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide and ahead of methane. And, but together, the soot particles plus the greenhouse gases, they cause a lot more warming than is observed. And then there's a tiny amount of urban heat island warming as well when you average over the globe. I mean, the urban surfaces are around 1% of uh, global surfaces. But you have a lot of 
other particles, pollution particles, that are reflective, that are light-colored particles from sulfates and nitrates, like sulfate is from sulfur dioxide from coal-fired power plants, and nitrates are from NOx, which are emitted by automobiles and power plants, and organic, certain organic material and certain ammonia. Anyway, these part cooling particles also enhance cloudiness, and they reflect more light, not only because they're light-colored, but also because they enhance cloudiness. So they offset or mask half of global warming. So if we didn't have these cooling particles, we'd actually have double the global warming in the system, and our planet would be really screwed. And it's ironic that these pollution particles, these cooling particles, which cause health effects, are actually masking half of global warming. And so in fact, 90% of air pollution mortality is due to particles, both the soot particles and the cooling particles. So we want to eliminate those particles. But if we eliminate all the particles, we're going to double the global warming. So the only solution to this is really to eliminate the greenhouse gases simultaneously with the pollution particles, all of them. And that requires most of these particles and the gases are emitted from fossil fuel combustion, but also biofuel combustion. And so we really need to eliminate combustion as a source of energy to electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean energy. And so this is what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is has one way, and maybe the only practical way, or maybe, I don't know if it's practical, but it's at least potentially practical, to address these serious problems is to electrify and to provide that electricity with clean renewable energy. So the major sectors, the major sectors that uh, we need to tr electrify are, well, transportation, heating and cooling, there's industry. I'll also list agriculture, forestry, and fishing, which I couldn't, didn't have room to put on here. So first, we, we want to electrify the transportation we would use we propose to use, which are pretty mainstream now, battery electric vehicles, uh, but also hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, where the hydrogen is produced from clean electricity. So that's what HFC is, hydrogen fuel cell, and BE is battery electric. So, you'd, so in fact, hydrogen fuel cell, battery electric hybrids, especially when we get to long distance trucks and ships and planes, most likely need hydrogen fuel cell, whereas all the short distance and moderate distance, we can use battery electrics on their own. Well, for heating and cooling, uh, we would use heat pumps for air and water heating, heat pump water heaters, heat pump air heaters, which run on electricity, and also some solar hot water preheating. But this is for all residential and commercial buildings, uh, heating and cooling, because heat pumps can be run in reverse for air conditioning. For industry, we'd use electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heating, some resistance heating, where all the electricity is, again, produced from clean renewable energy. So in the electric power sector, we would provide the electricity for all these other sectors from a combination of onshore and offshore winds, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power where you focus light off of mirrors onto a central tower to heat a fluid where the fluid heats up to really high temperature and can be stored overnight and then be used during the night or the next day to uh, produce electricity by heating up water to run to produce steam to run a steam turbine and geothermal power uh, Where it's available in the US. There are about 14 states that there's reasonable geothermal resources for electricity And we can also use geothermal for heat, but here I'm talking about geothermal for electricity uh, But then hydro existing hydroelectric we, we don't propose to build new dams, but we'd use existing dams more efficiently and small amounts of tidal and wave power. Uh, so these are all zero emitting during their operation, <coughs> but also there's some emissions during the production or of the devices themselves. And then we'll also need some storage for a 100% system. And we try to use st the most, first we'd use low cost storage and then ultimately use more expensive storage if necessary. But Concentrated solar power with storage, I just mentioned. That, that hot fluid that you can store overnight, that's really a storage material. Pumped hydroelectric power where you have two reservoirs 
a lower and an upper one. When you have excess electricity, you can pump water up a hill. And then when you need electricity, you let the water drain down the hill and run a turbine to generate electricity. Existing hydroelectric dams are basically big batteries where you can discharge them at will. It's hard to, can't charge them at will, but you can discharge them at will within seconds to produce electricity. And batteries themselves, though batteries are expensive compared to these other technologies, uh, just to give you an idea, like a battery is around $300 per kilowatt hour for storage, whereas CSP phase change material, well, CSP with a molten salt is around $30 per kilowatt hour of storage, and a phase change material is around $20 a kilowatt hour, so it's like one-tenth the cost. And then heating and cooling, because we're going to electrify all the energy sectors, we can now use heating and cooling inter almost interchangeably, or heating and cooling storage interchangeably with electric storage for some things. I'll give examples in a minute. But we'd use water, ice, and rocks in soil uh, for a lot of storage for heat and cold. And then also hydrogen is a form of storage that we'd use. And we'd also use demand response management of the grid, which is where utilities will give people incentives not to use electricity at, at peak times of the day. So let me give you an example of these types of storage. So uh, my university, Stanford, has had a big ice cube under a building for like 18 years now. And what, what it does is it produces electricity at night, sorry, it produces ice at night from low cost electricity. So it really uh, produces this big ice cube. And then during the day, instead of using air conditioning in the afternoon, where, which uses electricity, they run water through coils, like in this, this ice cube, to cool the water. And the water is then sent to the buildings to cool the buildings. So this, is a, this costs around $38 a kilowatt hour. It's really electricity storage because it offsets the use of electricity during peak times of the day. And this is used actually all over the place in stadiums and hospitals and big complexes. It's a pretty well-used technology, although many people don't know about it. And so here's another technology that's also existing, relatively low cost. Uh, so we, Stanford again had a, we had a big natural gas cogeneration plant that produced 80% of the campus heat plus electricity that was right outside my office until um, last year when they bulldozed it and re replaced it with two boilers and a chiller. The boilers are on the left and the chillers the, on the red roof on the right in an elaborate pipe, piping system throughout the university well, you can see on the right is the annual uh, cold demand, which is the, which is the bright blue. And the middle of the graph is summer. And the, you have January and December on the two ends. And the bright red is the heat demand. So any time of the year, there's both heat demand and cold demand. But when you produce heat, you release cold. And when you produce cold, you release heat. And usually that's wasted. But if you actually capture that, and send it through a piping system to these boilers and chillers where it can be stored and then shipped around the university where it's needed, you can recover all that shaded, the darker shades of cold and hot. And so this, combined with solar photovoltaics for electricity, replaced this 80%, or eliminated 80% of the carbon emissions from the university and eliminated the use of the gas plant. So this is just, you know, it took some time to put this together. And of course, the university can control its utilities and can build and make traffic stop so they can dig up a road and put a pipe in. But uh, it can be done. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Here's, um, this is an example of seasonal heat storage in rocks. Uh, this is a community in Okotoks, Canada, which is one hour south of Calgary. And there are 52 homes. As you can see on the top left, they have solar collectors on their garages. And in the solar collector is a glycol solution that in the summertime, which you have long summer days at northern latitudes, you collect sunlight, heat the solution. The solution then gets passed through pipes to this building on the right where it heats up water. The water then gets piped under this field, which had been excavated down to 30 meters and filled with rocks and then insulated around it. The rocks get heated up to 80 degrees Celsius. And that heat gets stored until winter time, which time the whole system is run in reverse to provide 100% of the heating when the snow is on the ground for these 52 homes. 
and the whole system is around 52, sorry, 56% to 58% efficient. And the cost of that, the storage is around $1, less than $1 per kilowatt hour compared to $300 for batteries. So, it's a re so you can afford the inefficiency of this because it's so cheap. But this is seasonal heat storage. So we want to think of doing these types of things on large scales to really solve this problem. So I'll come back to try to keep the grid reliable in a little bit, but these are just some examples. So you might ask, why not different things, such as why not nuclear? Well, and it's not like we're against nuclear, but you just don't think it's as good as some of these other technologies, and why? Well, it produces, for per kilowatt hour of energy, nuclear power is around six to 24 times more carbon dioxide emissions per kilowatt hour than wind power. Half of that's due to the fact that you have to refine uranium during the life of the nuclear power plant, which is a very energy intensive process. And half of it's due to the fact that it takes so long to put up a nuclear plant between 10 and 19 years compared to around two to five years for wind or solar that while you're waiting around for the nuclear, you're emitting background grid power, which is mostly coal and gas emissions. So that's called opportunity cost emissions that most people don't consider. But they're real emissions because if you're choosing, you're spending a certain amount of money on one versus the other. One's going to take 10 to 19 years. The other's going to take two to five years. So you have to account for those additional emissions while you're waiting around. But the fact is, you can't even take the same amount of money and buy the same thing because nuclear also costs right now about three to four times more per kilowatt hour than onshore wind. And as a result, you're really getting one third to one fourth the energy for the same amount of money you're putting in. But the other issues are, it's not, there's, we're looking at energy security and you know, one, 0.5% of all nuclear reactors ever built to date have melted down to some degree. And the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says there's robust evidence and high agreement that nuclear, the expansion of nuclear energy to meet climate goals in particular uh, would, could lead, I didn't say would, but it could lead to enhanced nuclear weapons proliferation since five countries of the world have secretly developed weapons under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs. And there are also waste risks and mining risk. And why not more natural gas? Or because people say, well, gas is cleaner than coal. Well, that's also debatable. In terms of air pollution, yes, it's, re it's lower particle emissions. Uh, some, lower, some of the gases are lower. But in terms of climate, because of the methane emissions uh, from natural gas and because coal Ironically, because it is so polluting in terms of air pollution, it actually produces a lot of those particles that, that mask global warming, whereas the, the, the natural gas is actually fewer particles and so has less masking. So actually, in terms of climate, natural gas is much worse actually than coal, but in terms of air pollution, coal is much worse than gas. So they're both bad. But then, but look at this, these statistics. I mean, most people aren't aware that there are 2.5 million abandoned oil and gas wells in the United States and 1.7 million active oil and gas wells. And the area required for those are just for the 2.5 million abandoned wells, that takes up an, those take up an area, including the well pads, the roads, the storage facilities, an area the size of Maine, the state of Maine, and another 1.7 million active wells. And you need 20,000 more of these every year forever to maintain our use of natural gas. So this is something that's caused the industrialization of the Great Plains. It's, it's starting to look like this. You know, so it's really destroying America and then Canada as well. And other places where this gas drilling and fracking is go and also fracking, which is one type of the gas drilling. But hydrofracking in particular, where you spray water laced with chemicals under high pressure to crack rock, causes even more methane emissions than conventional gas drilling, and this is a big concern. Why not what we call clean coal, or some people call it clean coal, or coal with carbon capture? And, well, this photo is kind of funny because they're criticizing the wind turbines in the background. <laughs> you can barely see. <laughs> but, uh, so clean, the clean coal is where, or 
Coal with carbon capture is where you take CO2 emissions from a coal stack, coal-fired power plant, effluent stack, and you pump them underground into a cavern of some sort. And that does reduce 85 to 90% of the CO2 emissions from the stack. However, it doesn't reduce any of the emissions from the upstream mining or transport of the coal. Plus, you need 25% more mining and transport because you need 25% more coal to run the carbon capture equipment. And the carbon capture equipment doesn't reduce any of the other pollutants from coal, such as mercury or NOx or uh, hydrocarbons or partic other particulate matter. In fact, all those go up 25%. And so, in fact, it's really, it should be called dirty coal because it's actually dirtier in terms of air pollution than regular coal burning. It's just you get less CO2, but you get less CO2, but you still get 50 times more CO2 than wind power per kilowatt hour generated because you're still emitting, you know, on the, I mean, just to give you some numbers, I mean, it's, uh, the emissions from a coal-fired power plant stack are around 900 to 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Then there are another 300 to 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour from the upstream mining and transport. So we're talking, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And when you put the carbon capture equipment on, you still have that 300 to 500 from the upstream. You have to increase those 25%, plus you have 10 to 15% from the stack. So you still have, whereas wind is about 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, accounting for the, the building of the turbines and the decommissioning at the end of the life. So you have still huge amounts of CO2, and you haven't, you haven't solved this problem. The only benefit of this carbon capture is keeping the coal industry in business, which has its benefits in terms of jobs, but the jobs, you're going to create more jobs with clean renewable energy, as I'll discuss. Plus, these jobs are not great jobs. They're jobs that give people black lung disease for the miners. And anyway, I'm not going to talk more about that. So why not, why not biofuels? So this is one comparison of the land area alone. Well, first of all, ethanol, for example, for transportation fuel, the, you still burn the fuel, and the air pollution is similar to or greater than gasoline emissions in terms of air pollution health problems. The climate benefits or disbenefits are debatable depending on how much energy goes into cultivating the, the corn or whatever fuel you're using, and then transporting it, and then refining it, and transporting it again. But just look at the land area. To, produce, to transform the U.S. vehicle fleet to cellulosic ethanol, which is advanced ethanol that doesn't exist at the commercial scale. It's you know, on the order of 20% of the US land area, including Alaska. Corn ethanol is on the order of 14 or 15%. And well, nuclear doesn't take up a lot of land area. It's maybe the size of Rhode Island, which, hey, we don't need Rhode Island, right? <laughs> but no, it's, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, Anyway, it's, it's a, you know, it's not that, that's not one of the big issues with nuclear. It's actually small, it's a small area. But, you know, for wind to do the same thing, there's two areas. One's called the footprint and one's called the spacing. The spacing area is about half of 1% of the U.S. So it's one, almost 1 30th the land area required for corn ethanol to do the same thing. But the footprint area is that little dot in the center. It's less than four square kilometers or three square kilometers actually which is the, the area of the, tu the tubular turbine hitting the ground plus some cements around it. So this is what I call the footprint. And that footprint, it was, you need about 100 and, well, 73,000 to 145,000 five megawatt wind turbines to power the whole US vehicle fleet. And it would take literally less than three square kilometers of land for the towers and the rest is open space between the turbines that can be used for multiple purposes. So that's the spacing area. And a lot of this could go offshore, of course. And then, but solar and geothermal, solar takes one third the spacing area of winds to do the same thing, but more footprint area on the ground if you have utility scale solar. Of course, no footprint if it's all on rooftops. And geothermal is even less spacing area than wind or solar because it's, yeah, it's basically a building plus two holes in the ground, and you don't, but there's not, you're not gonna grow a lot of geothermal. Anyway, the wind and the solar and the geothermal, they're not taking up a lot of area, but the, you know, they 
uh, ethanol or any type of biofuel, you know, it takes photosynthesis is only 1% efficient. So only 1% of the energy of the sun gets used to, can be converted to energy with a biofuel. Whereas a solar panel is around 20% efficient. So 20 times more energy for the same land area from a solar panel as a biofuel. So why not just, you know, to get the same energy as this biofuel, why not just uh, put solar panels and you need 1 20th the land area. Okay, so the next question is, can we actually take these energy technologies and power the entire world for all purposes with them, with the wind, the water, and the solar? And so we did roadmaps or plans for 50 United States and 139 countries, and this, this shows the summary for the 139 countries. Among all the countries, and this is starting with 2012, energy demand in all these countries. It's around 12.1 trillion watts or terawatts. And this is for all purposes. So again, electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing. If we go up to 2050, power demand goes up to 21 terawatts with a business as usual case, assuming the trajectories that are thought by the International Energy Agency and the, the EIA, which is US Energy Agency. But if we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energies, we get this interesting result of 42.5% reduction of power demand, of which 23% is due to the fact that electricity, the, the actual energy output to work input ratio of electricity is much, is much greater than for combustion. And so, for example, let's say take an electric car. Electric car, about 80 to 86% of the electricity going in the car goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. For a gasoline car, only 17 to 20% of the energy embodied in gasoline goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. And so you reduce your power demand by, in an electric car by a factor of four to five. And so in that case, you get like a 70 to 80% reduction of power demand with an electric car. But that's where you get the best benefit. In the other sectors, aside from transportation, like heating and cooling, industry, you're only getting minor benefits of electrification. So, but when you average over all sectors, you get about a 23% reduction of power demand worldwide uh, by electrifying on its own. But then you also eliminate another 12.6%, almost 13%, of energy worldwide that goes into mining, transporting, and refining fossil fuels. Imagine, I mean, 13% of all of the energy used worldwide is just to dig stuff up and transform it into something that's useful. Whereas in the case of wind or solar, the wind comes right to the turbine and the solar comes right to the panel. So you eliminate the, you know, the middle energy use. And then we're assuming we can get another 7% energy efficiency improvement beyond the business as usual case due to more efficient appliances, more efficient light bulbs and weatherizing homes and uh, you know, more telecommuting, things like that. And so that's, that's pretty conservative from most people's ideas. So overall, that's 42.5%. So we end up needing 11.8 terawatts or trillion watts of power. So what's, how can we get that? So this is one way from the 139 country plans when we summed over all these countries. And of course, this is not the only possible mix. And by the way, this is not every country is like this. In fact, no specific country is like this. This is the, this is the average or sum over all countries. So each country is actually has its own mix, but this is kind of the, the average in terms of percent supply. So it'd be about 23.5% onshore wind, 13.6% offshore wind, 16% residential rooftop, photovoltaics, 12.2% commercial government uh, photovoltaics on the rooftops, about 20% photovoltaic power plants, utility scale PV power plants, about 10% concentrated solar power plants, less than 1% geothermal, 4% hydroelectric. And on the right column, that's the number of new devices we would need of, this, of the given size that's listed on the left. So you can see we don't need any new hydro, it's all there and then a tiny amount of tidal and wave power. In terms of wind, it's around 2.6 or 7 million new 
large wind turbines, five megawatts. And you know, I mentioned that we need, and this, this is worldwide, by the way, and this represents, those 139 countries represent more than 99% of all emissions worldwide. So 2.6 million wind turbines. Remember I mentioned that the number of gas wells that are dead in the US alone is 2.5 million or something? So you know, we're talking, the numbers are not staggering here. And these are one-time investments, at least every, you know, maybe every 30 years you have to refurbish or maybe sometimes replace some of these technologies. But, and of course we're gonna have to, this is for, two, these are 2050 numbers. You know, so 2100, I'm sure this will grow more. But this is, a, it's a manageable thing. I mean, the United States alone produced 330,000 aircraft during World War II and the world produced around 730,000. That's in five years, and so we're, you know, these numbers are not so bad, considering we also, right now, every year, the world produces around 70 to 80 million automobiles. We have about you know, 800 million auto automobiles in the world. So this is, these are just devices that can be manufactured and you can create jobs. What about the land area required? Uh, so the blue is the world, area of the world, uh, the red is the land area, and the lighter red is the land area of those 139 countries. And the green on the bottom is the area of the onshore wind, the spacing area, which can be used for farming, ranching, open space. Um, and that's onshore, a separate offshore wind is in the blue part. Utility PV plus CSP, that'll take up about 0.23% of world land. The, the spacing area for wind is about 0.92%. The rest of the area is rooftop PV, which doesn't take up new land. Geothermal, which is a trivial amount of land. Hydro is zero. So really the only land area required is about 1.2% you know, of the world's land. And most of that is spacing area that can be used for multiple purposes. And considering like 20% of the world's land is agriculture, this is not a bad use of land. This does not account for eliminating the land required for fossil fuel, mining, transport and use, refineries, nuclear plants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we did state plans for uh, all 50 states. And you know, these, are, these state plans were done before the country plan, so there's, you know, we've modified our techniques slightly, but this was the numbers for Delaware uh, at the time. And so at the time, it was about 5% residential rooftop photovoltaics. 4% uh, commercial government rooftop, so about 9% rooftop PV, 20% PV power plants, no concentrated solar power plants because you need more direct sunlight for it to be effective with CSP, but about 5% onshore wind and 65% offshore wind. You know, again, this is one scenario, it's not the only possible way, but this is one scenario that could potentially work if, you know, especially if it's interconnected with the background grid. And, uh, point five, half a percent of tidal and one percent wave as well. And we calculate the number of jobs that would be net jobs created. This only shows the jobs created, not the jobs destroyed, but there was a net job creation. Well, all the numbers for these plans can be found um, on the website I'll show you later. But this particular graph, you can actually find it if you're interested directly at uh, thesolutionsproject.org which is a nonprofit that basically takes these energy plans and tries to make nice graphs and educate the public about them. But uh, so this, but this, each state's plan really represents one scenario of an endpoint of what, what it could look like in 2050 to satisfy all the energy for all sectors, assuming electrification of all the energy sectors in the state. And there are a lot of other statistics not shown that are further down on this. What about grid reliability? So we did a study uh, that was published in 2015 on, can, after taking the, well, taking, do, after doing the 50 state plans, we looked at the 48 contiguous US states. It was kind of an idealized case where we assumed that the transmission was perfect, but we combined the, well, we took the 48 contiguous state plans, put the numbers of wind turbines and solar panels in a weather prediction model to predict the 
the weather and the energy, the winds and the solar radiation in particular, and the, every 30 seconds for six years, the, the wind fields and the resulting uh, wind output and solar output, accounting for competition among the wind turbines for available energy in the wind. So that would give us this field over the US every, for every state of winds and solar every 30 seconds. Then we combine that with pro projected loads of energy demand in 2050, starting with current energy demand and going forward. And after, then we electrified all the energy sectors. And we tried to match those power demand with supply every 30 seconds for six years by combining the renewable supply with the low cost storage options I mentioned, which included the heat, the water, ice, the rocks, uh, the hydroelectric, the CSP, and also pumped hydro. And we actually did it without batteries, except for batteries in cars, without stationary batteries for electricity. And we also had hydrogen and demand response. And we, were, we found that we were able to match the power demand every 30 seconds for six years. This shows results on the monthly average for the six years of, over the whole US, where the blue is the demand plus changes of storage plus the losses, and the red is the energy supply. Uh, this shows the same thing for two sets of four days every hour. And we're able to match the supply with the demand exactly, in fact, every 30 seconds, as I mentioned, for six years. So, and this was at reasonably low cost, which I'll show in a second. Well, first, let's look at the cost of the ge energy generation itself. Keep in mind that the cost of energy is a combination of the generation cost, transmission and distribution costs, the storage costs, and, and you know, there's other t taxes and things like that. This is just the generation cost of energy. And this is mostly from Lazard 2015. So they do an analysis of the levelized cost of energy for different technologies. And so these numbers, even now, some of them are out of date, but um, these were the numbers that were produced at that point. So onshore wind right now is the, is the cheapest form of electricity in the United States by far in terms of new generation. It's a mean of, and the, actually this onshore wind number, the mean of 3.6 is really from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They also do a report every year on the, all sorts of statistics from wind. And that, their number of 3.6 fits right into this range. But 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour, that's half the cost of gas, which is 5.2 to 7.8 cents a kilowatt hour. Hydroelectric is still around four to six cents a kilowatt hour, it's pretty cheap, but we're not growing new hydro. Utility scale solar is a surprise because it's actually dropped, so it's actually cheaper than natural gas on average. Of course, if you're in northern latitude, it's gonna be more expensive, but most of the cheap solar is really in the, where it's sunnier. And you know, coal is more expensive uh, for new coal. And you know, geothermal's in the mid-range as well. Can you notice that, well, you notice rooftop PV for residences is really expensive on this. And then, but if you have community rooftop PV, it's like half the cost. What is community rooftop PV? That's when you have, instead of one residence, you have like three to five or six or seven residences in a neighborhood going together to get PV panels. It becomes cheaper really fast by getting more panels and pooling the labor due to economies of scale. You're using the same panels, it's exact same panels with the residential rooftop and the community PV. In fact, it's the same panels as with the utility scale PV. It's just economies of scale. If you can do these on larger scale, the costs go down so much. But this is unsubsidized. Of course, there are subsidies in the US. You get a 30% tax credit for the residential rooftop. So you can take 30% off that right away. Plus, you can also take the tax credit off the roof you put on, including the stanchions, if you're building a roof at the same time, if it goes towards helping with the PV. So there's a lot of tax credit room in there, but I don't know how long that will last, so <laughs> better get your rooftop solar quickly. Um, so anyway, we looked, you know, we accounted for all these variations of cost of these different types, I mean, particularly the wind, water, and the solar, including the cost of offshore wind, which is more expensive than onshore wind right now, in deriving the cost of energy 
for the mix that we assumed for the 50 United States or 48 contiguous states. So the cost of energy from the study we did with the grid integration study, the direct cost of energy plus the transmission and distribution cost of all the, the actual mix we used for the whole US was about 8.86 cents a kilowatt hour. And the storage plus the hydrogen cost were another 0.8 cents a kilowatt hour. And so the total cost is around 9.7 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's similar to the conventional fuel uh, electricity plus transmission distribution cost. And these are 2,050 costs, but brought back to 2,013 dollars. But conventional fuels also have around 13 cents a kilowatt hour of health costs and another 15 cents per kilowatt hour in climate costs for 2050. So we're really talking 37 cents a kilowatt hour versus 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And this is the difference. You're just, you're eliminating the health and climate costs, whereas the direct cost of energy can be similar in both cases. What about the timeline to the transition? Well, we need, in order to avoid one and a half degrees warming, we need 80% reduction of conventional fuel or CO2 emissions and all the other emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. That will actually get that will actually get you right to the limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So in this timeline, we're proposing that by 2050 you get 100% transition and by 2030 80% transmission transition. And this graph starts in 2012, but in 2015 we're still pretty low, or 2016 we're still low. Uh, but if we don't do anything, we go up along the top line. We have 20.6 terawatts of power worldwide in 2050. If we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy, we, we go down those two shades of gray, which are the power demand reductions due to the efficiency of electricity and the reduction, elimination of energy and mining and transporting and refining fuels, plus the reduction due to end use energy efficiency improvements. So we get to the 100% line, and by 2050, we want to power that 100% by the wind, the water, and the solar. So this just gives you kind of a guideline of the pace at which things have to happen. So we're talking about, we need like a five to 6% conversion each year from now until 2030 to actually get an 80% reduction by 2030. And I know this is very optimistic in terms of, well, this is something that not saying will happen and saying it's something that it's a goal to shoot for because it's really the only way to actually solve the problem. If you wanted to, do, just to give you an example, if you wanted to try to solve the same problem with nuclear power, it's gonna take 10 to 19 years. So let's say an average of 15 years just to put up one plant from today. That's 2031. If you start planning today, the next plant goes up 2031. You need 18,000 of these plants to replace all the energy infrastructure of the world. And you only have 400 in the world today and they're not really increasing. You have some increasing in, in a few countries, but they're, they're offset by the number decreasing in other countries retiring. So it's almost impossible, well, I will say it is impossible to do it with nuclear power, even if there were no other problems associated with it. Now, wind and solar takes on the order for, at least for onshore wind and utilities, solar on the order of two to five years on average. And things can be sped up even. So there's a possibility. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but there's a possibility. Well, let me look at, this is a, a study that's in progress, but looking at, well, what's the impact on CO2 levels in the atmosphere of different scenarios because we're talking about 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Well, first, so this is uh, showing year from 1750 to 2100 on the horizontal axis and carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere on the vertical axis. And between 1750 and 2000, I show these red dots where the, which are the observed CO2 levels. Uh, the older ones are from ice core data and the newer ones since, uh, late 1950s are from Mauna Loa, Hawaii. And the line underneath that is model prediction. And so the model is able to predict the CO2 levels in the atmosphere pretty well. And then starting in 2016, we have these projections of different emission scenarios. And the bottom one, the green line, is if you eliminated all 
CO2 emissions and all related emissions today, which won't happen, but that just gives you a lower limit. The CO2 level then can drop to 345 parts per million, or 335, sorry, 335 parts per million. So that's the best you could do. If you go 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050, you get the blue line, and that gets you 350 parts per million by 2100. So you can actually recover the CO2 if you do a large scale conversion starting today. The black line is 80% by 2050 and 100% by 2100. All the other lines are intergovernmental panel on climate change projections on different, for, for different emission scenarios that have been considered, which are basically, some are more aggressive than others, but none are as drastic as we're talking about. They're very conservative scenarios in terms of what emission reductions can or will occur. But my point is, <coughs> it is possible, I believe, to reverse the problem of global warming and which will follow when the CO2 levels go down as well. The temperature changes won't respond immediately to the CO2 levels, but they'll follow eventually. So if I were to summarize, well, I want to you know, spend a few minutes summarizing and then also just kind of tell you what, what can happen in the future or what are some of the things that have been happening. Um, these, well, for these 139 country plans that we've been developing, uh, we find that they can reduce power demand worldwide by on the order of 42 percent, avoid four to seven million air pollution deaths, which would save about 23 trillion dollars in or avoid 23 trillion dollars in cost trillion, avoid another 27 trillion dollars in climate costs by 2050, and each person saves about $85 per year in fuel costs. So keep in mind, although the levelized cost of direct, the direct cost of energy is similar in the wind, water, solar, and the business as usual case, you need 42% less energy in overall with wind, water, solar. Okay, so you, even though the cost per unit energy is similar, the actual amount of energy you need is less. So that's why you save money. Each person saves money in their pocketbook. But there's a huge cost savings in terms of climate and, and health that are internalized uh, from a social cost point of view in terms of tax rates and insurance premiums, workman's compensation rates, and uh, lost work days, lost school days, and hospitalization costs and emergency room visit costs. And the cost of energy, as I mentioned, well, I, Here's a kind of a more of a range, nine and a half to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. I give you kind of the median number before. We also calculate that we create about 24 million net jobs minus loss. These are permanent long-term jobs, not just temporary construction jobs. They're continuous construction jobs plus operation jobs. And in the US, it's about 2 million net jobs versus loss by doing this transition. We'd require only about 0.22% of the World, the world's land for footprint and about 0.92% for spacing. We make ener countries energy independent because all these plans really show how each country can generate its own energy, although it'll turn out to be more advantageous to then be connected by the grid to other countries nearby or other states. And, but making countries more energy independent would reduce international conflict, would create more distributed power, which reduces the risk of large power outages affecting a big city, but also reducing terrorism risk because you don't have a big power plant that you can target. We can reduce energy poverty by up to 4 billion people who are, have, who are in energy poverty, including 1.5 billion who have no access to energy. But there are challenges and barriers. This is very capital intensive. Uh, whereas fossil fuels have lower capital costs, they have high fuel costs, where clean renewable energy technologies like wind and solar have high capital costs but no fuel costs. So there's upfront capital costs needed. You need transmission to some degree, long distance, high voltage direct currents in particular. Uh, we have to overcome lobbying and politics by those who want to keep the current infrastructure. Um, but we do find that materials are not limits. Um, then I would just want to mention for a few minutes, well, because we've been doing these plans for a while, I just want to talk about some of the policy implications. Um, 
so this kind of all started back in 2009 uh, when Mark DeLucci is a, a researcher at UC Berkeley now, uh, and I did a study can it, just analyzing uh, kind of back of the envelope, is it possible to power the whole world on its own? We didn't look at individual countries, just the world as a whole with wind, water, and solar. And the conclusion was, while it's technically and economically possible to do this by 2030, there are social and political barriers that make it more practical that to be able to do a transition by 2050, and but we're hoping that 80% by 2030. Subsequently, we ended up doing more detailed global plans and then individual state plans for New York and California. Uh, we brought the plans to the governor's offices in New York and California, and in New York, the, there are a lot of groups that then latched onto the plans who are anti-fracking groups, and it was this, this New York energy plan was used basically as a, an alternative to fracking in New York. And, this, and it, so with the help of, well, lots of activism in New York, the governor banned the use of fracking, so New York is now, fracking is not legal there, but then governor proposed the law, the clean energy standard mandating 50% clean renewable electricity by 2030. And more recently, the New York Senate bill, there's a Senate bill proposed for New York to go to 100% clean renewable energy by 2030, which uses the, the New York energy plan as the basis for this. And in California, similarly, we approached the governor's office in California, and two months later, the governor proposed California to go 50% clean renewable energy for the electric power sector and 50% electric vehicles. But that part, the vehicle part, was gutted by the oil industry and we influenced some central California, Central Valley lawmakers. So it wasn't passed, but the, but the clean renewable electricity was passed in 2030. Subsequently, the US House has proposed, maybe over a year ago, a, a Bill 540, well, it's a House Resolution 540, based on our 50 state plans for the US to go to 100% clean renewable energy and this has 46 co-sponsors. Of course, it's not going to pass because um, you know why. Uh, the Democratic platform <laughs> then called for America to be running on entirely on 100% on clean energy by mid-century, which really followed from the fact that three, the three candidates, the three Democratic candidates, adopted the 100% plans, although it doesn't matter anymore. Um, <laughs> But it could have mattered, right? <laughs> um, so even Hillary Clinton said she had she have her on video saying she wants to go to 100% clean renewable energy by 2050. We should do nothing that interferes with or undermines our efforts to reach that goal as soon as it is possible. Bernie Sanders uh, put our the Solutions Project maps on his website and supported 100% clean renewable energy. And Martin O'Malley was actually the first one to do that. Um, so a lot of cities now because there, now there seems to have been a movement around this. A lot of cities are now committing to go to 100% clean renewable energy, and here's a list of them. And many companies, and you can see uh, re100.org has a list of the 82 companies that have committed to 100% clean renewable energy, including many of the major ones uh, listed here. So there's a lot of good news in all this, that there's a lot of groups in fact, here are a lot of nonprofits who are now committed to going to 100% renewable energy along with the Solutions Project, which is the group that I helped co-found with a few other people, and including the Sierra Club and 350.org and Greenpeace. They're all, so this is, it's good to have a lot of people who are supportive of this because you know, this is never going to happen unless people want it to happen. And you know, I do try to do science and then provide information for people to use. And if there weren't people who then took this information and uh, tried to get it, spread the information because I think that's the biggest barrier is information. People are not aware of what's possible. And it's great to have these groups who can get information out because otherwise all this just collects dust in a journal paper. And so anyway, it's, um, it's been great working with these groups to try to you know, get the information out and hopefully the lawmakers will then b benefit. But there, as I mentioned, there are a lot of cities now and municipalities that are interested in clean renewable energy. Uh, and 
this is really the way probably to go in the next few years in the United States at the state and city levels, uh, because as we know, no, nothing's gonna happen at the federal level. And so I, I, one more thing I wanna mention, there were a couple of surveys that were taken about this, because you might think, well, nobody really cares about clean energy or a large scale, but it turns out they do, and it's really surprising. These two opinion surveys, one in New York State and one in Australia, where you can see about 1,400 people, and it's the whole country of Australia, 60% of the people in New York want 100% clean renewable energy. This is not just renew more renewable energy, this is 100%. And that's more than a majority, and 63% in Australia. And 90% want more wind in New York. So these are good signs that you know, there are people who really, you don't have to talk about global warming, because a lot of people still don't believe in global warming. You don't have to talk about that to convince people to be interested in renewable energy because there's so many benefits of clean renewable energy, as I mentioned, in terms of jobs, in terms of costs of energy, in terms of energy stability and energy security, that it's not necessary to debate people who don't want to believe in climate change about this. And there are a lot of people, I think, who are in the background who are really interested in this, in a, as long as it's not made into a political issue. So I'll just end with just a couple of websites. Um, the actual are the articles that I've talked about, the studies are at that website above. Uh, the maps for the state and country plans are all available at the solutionsproject.org and 100.org. And in fact, you can also find a link at the bottom of the maps to the top website in case you don't want to write it down. Anyway, I'll stop there and then answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Right. Well, if you're looking for which, what to research, I assume that you're talking about what type of research to do or what type of study or what to do in your own life. Okay, well, what to do in your own life, I mean, anybody can help at their own scale. Like if, if you own a house, for example, electrifying your house using appliances. So instead of using a gas heater for water, air, heat pump, water heater, heat pump, air heaters, they cost about the same induction cooktop stoves instead of gas stoves, electric dryers instead of gas dryers, electric cars instead of gasoline cars, solar on your roof, weatherizing your home, LED light bulbs. Just think of everything in your house or apartment or that where you're emitting gas and replace it. That's the first thing. For, and then in terms of professional research, there's a lot of you know, storage, of course, is something that there's a lot of work that can be done. There are a lot of potential storage options that can be perfected or made better or even invented still. Uh, you know, offshore wind is certainly one of the things that's more expensive still and trying to reduce the cost of offshore wind. Uh, there's a lot of research going on in floating wind turbines, just making things lighter, uh, more tractable parts. Of course, Willet, Kempton can tell you a lot more about what's, what's available there. Um, but in s devices, yeah, think of, I mean, fuel cells, long distance trucks, trains, aircraft, there's, that's a whole uncharted territory. How do you, combination of using hydrogen plus electric to make that efficient, faster charging, uh, more yeah, b batteries, of course, to make batteries more efficient. Uh, yeah, it can go on in terms of, yeah, going through all the different appliances and seeing how can you make them better. That's really what I'd say. One more question. Yes, sir, thank you for being here and all the wonderful work that you're doing. It seems like a no-brainer in terms of where we should go. I'm, I'm uh, just wondering what advice you give in terms of getting word, how best get word to our decision makers within yeah. 
Well, that I think, as I mentioned, information is the biggest barrier. And to the extent that you can provide, well, I mean, they're the plans themselves. I mean, if you're for the from a state level or a country level, uh, you know, we have thing, we have papers and plan, and actual plans for each state that can be handed on a, you know, one page of paper, you know, one plan on one piece of paper, but. So, yeah, somehow getting an audience to, with the policymakers, but the NGOs tend to have their, they usually have a good inside track into a lot of policymakers, like like NRDC and Sierra Club, you know, and 350.org. They, you know, they they do get into the policymakers. So if you talk with some of these nonprofits, they might be more they probably more efficient than trying to individually talk to the policymakers. Uh, but to also tell your friends too, you know, like uh, if if you're aware, the more information you have at your fingertips, the easier it is to give to your friends and family as well. I have a question, which I hope is not inflammatory. If, if you were asked by Donald Trump to explain to him <laughs> in one minute yeah. why climate change is real, what would you say? <laughs> why climate change is real? <coughs> I mean, okay. oh, no, how, I can tell. how would you present it to him in a way he could understand that, that, that well, the science, but in, in a way he could understand. Well, I would say that although temperatures in the Earth's history have been higher than today, I mean, four billion years ago the Earth was molten. 100 million years ago the the Earth was ice free, but nobody lived back then. Right now we have 7.3 billion people on the Earth, and the rate of change of temperature today is much higher. The rate of increase of temperature is much higher than any time in known history. It's 10 times higher, sorry, four times higher than deglaciation from the last ice age. It's 25 times higher than during the last 1,000 years. So the t temperature record is pretty clear, and it's agreed, the temperature record is agreed by satellite, by what's called radiosonde, where you measure vertical temperature profiles, by surface stations, land-based, and ship-based measurements. So in fact, there's, there's little dispute about the temperature record today. The question is really, what are the impacts? And certainly there's in, uh, concerns about what the impacts are, but there are 70 to 80 meters of sea level that ultimately will be melted and that will flood 7% of the world's land. And you can see sea level rise just in the, off Florida coast has risen about a foot in the last 50 years. And it's accelerating if you look at the trends. And this is causing more storm surge impacts, the whole, the impacts of Sandy in New York. I mean, he felt that directly. The high, because you had these higher sea levels already and then the storm surge comes in and blows that water on the shore, you get much more flooding and this is gonna happen more and more in the future. But, you know, I, I, think, I think it's a lost cause to try to argue somebody, something that people don't wanna hear. So I'd rather try to convince them that renewable energy is something that's worthwhile going to. Thank you. Thank you.